So this, in this session, we have a couple of talks about uh, building businesses around, around open source. And the first talk is uh, from Emma about her experience in Canada. Uh, thanks very much. So this is a, a talk that I've actually given a couple of times before. And I um, was sitting down perhaps this weekend to just go over my notes and make sure that everything was still relevant. And uh, I realized that the, the lessons that I um, advocated in uh, previous years with this same talk were still relevant, but I had a lot of new information to add. And so this talk has now become the, um, the if, you, if you only scratch your own itch, you will fail talk. And it, it involves a lot of finger wagging. It's a lot of fun now, as opposed to before when it was all happy, shiny successes. So I'm, I'm Emma Jane Hogbin. You may know me from such projects as Drupal, Ubuntu, StatusNet, uh, stuff and things. I'm all over the internet. Um, and this, this talk is essentially a how-to for freelance small business companies. How many people feel that that's their kind of company? Great, about half of you, that's cool. Um, and how many people think that there's gonna be jokes about sheep and pumpkins and that's why they're here? Right on, yeah, okay, so some of you have seen me present before, this will be good. So um, a couple of the lessons here um, are more fully developed. I wanted to try and squish things down to cover the new information that I have. These how-to talks are available on, ooh, the laser pointer's kind of weak, isn't it? Uh, the 100 milecliantrostercom uh, if you decide that these are lessons that you want to learn. I'm gonna whiz by them in this talk. So the first thing that I've come to realize in much of my life is that defining success is incredibly important. And there's a lot of different ways that you can define success. In the, the business that I operate, which is essentially a freelance web development business in Owen Sound, Ontario, Canada, you've never heard of it, that's fine, it's got about 20,000 people. Um, to me, success wasn't tied to specific economic goals. So I wanted to help communities of all kinds to maintain vibrant and productive interactions using FOSS tools and open business practices. And there's nothing in there that has to do with my, um, my scalability as a company, the number of employees, the number of uh, gross money that I wanted to bring in in a given year. I really just wanted to help my local businesses. I found that the more I did online um, with the larger contracts that I was working on, the less I felt connected to my local community. So my definition of success may be very, very different from your defini definition of success and definitely involves no GNU cash. So we've got a couple of lessons to start out with. Um, the first one is from my cousin Nancy Jacoby and she runs an incredibly successful paper shop in Toronto. She's one of North America's largest uh, importers of Japanese paper. And one of the things that she's taught me over the years is to never, ever discount. Uh, she doesn't have sales. She doesn't um, reduce in any way the, the value of the product. But what she does is she gives away paper for free to artists. And what she does is she treats with reverence, the reverence that they deserve, these incredible handmade Japanese sheets of paper to artists. And she gifts it to them much like the second lesson we'll see in terms of, of open source software, but she gives it to them with the story of the maker and the story of how their family has been, you know, this is uh, information that has been passed down for generations, that this the paper has uh, incredible tensile qualities, it's uh, harvested, whether it's gampy tissue or whatever the fiber happens to be, and she gives this incredible sheet of paper, maybe one or maybe two sheets of paper to an artist, and the artist is so bound by this gift, that they feel the need to reciprocate, to give something back or in, in some way to, uh, to support her store, to, to recognize the gift that she's given. Because of this gift, and also because she's one of the very few people that they can get these papers from, she increases her business in ways that a sale would have never generated. Because people feel tied to that story and they, they feel the need to reciprocate her gift by actually spending money in her store. That idea of reciprocity and free should sound familiar to a lot of people who are at an open source conference. 
because that is essentially what we do. Now, how many people uh, consider themselves in some way connected to a project or producers of free and open source software? Does anyone not feel connected to free and open source software? So you are essentially all producing that same paper. You have the story that you're going to give to someone and you hope that perhaps in return they will either buy your service, um, probably not your product because your product is probably free, but perhaps they'll contribute back. Perhaps there's some way that the gift that you're giving people of your time will come back to you, uh, hopefully in ways that will help pay your rent or your mortgage. It's a very similar experience, I think. So the idea of giving away your best service, though, is usually in the open source world, I mean, this is typically, we give away our product for free. We don't give away our service for free. This is, I don't want to say radical thinking, but it does sometimes feel a little bit like radical thinking. What I ran into with my clients is that so many of them, let's see if that's the next, oh yeah, I have to explain my community. Um, so many of my clients were so small that it really wasn't worth my time to deal with their three minute questions every time. And so I decided that the best way to deal with them was to pool these clients and treat them essentially as one, uh, one entity instead of multiple businesses. So this is, this is about a 20 minute drive from my house. This is the Canadian National Pumpkin Chucking Contest. This is uh, a, the trebuchet division. Um, there is also um, all other divisions, which I'll get to in a second. In the back, the laser pointer doesn't work well, but you see markers. Those are uh, distances, much like golf, if anyone golfs. Um, and uh, essentially what you do is you let it fly, and then the, the ATVs at the back there go and measure how far your pumpkin has gone. This is taken incredibly seriously. There's a, a strong sense of community. They've had to move it to another field because competitors got so good that they almost took out someone's window. Um, but this is, you know, it's an international competition, and uh, this is a Canadian trebuchet. There's also the Americans who come up with their air cannons. Um, much, much more difficult. You can see here, this is actually a failure. The pumpkin has exploded midair. This is, um, this is Jack O'Lantern, uh, the international champion. Uh, on the one hand, I'd like to mock the fact that this is the Canadian and this is the American entries in the pumpkin chucking contest. Notice how they have uh, actually an entire tent that surrounds, you know, over in Canada, we've got slickers. Uh, so as much as I like to mock it, it um, does launch an incredible pumpkin. So we do, on the one hand, have this absurdity to living in a small town that is absolutely intense and serious. For the businesses that are in our local area, on the one hand, you may look at them and think, well, this is incredibly, it's small, it's tiny, who cares? but they are incredibly passionate about the, bus the business that they offer, the service that they offer. And because of that intensity and because of that passion, it was really important to me to come offline and reconnect with these businesses locally. So this is sort of how the 100-mile client roster came to be, and it's uh, sort of a, a play on the concept of the 100-mile diet, which was um, a couple of Canadians, kooky Canadians, decided that they would only for a year eat food that had been produced, grown and produced within 100 miles of their home. And my 100 mile client roster are the people that are in my physical community. Although the concepts here could apply to an online business, I'm interested in the physical part of it. So let's take a look at uh, how this works. If we think of a Linux user group where no one pays, everyone shows up and gets free support, uh, you may have install fest, you may have speakers, you may have any kind of interaction that makes sense for your community of, of Linux users, um, it's very much a together we're going to help one another. In a lot of ways, what I wanted to do was have that feeling, but outside of a chamber of commerce, which is typically what you'd see with businesses. In my experience, in my town, the chamber of commerce focuses more on B2B discounting. And that's not how I want to support my local businesses. I don't want to ask them to stay in business by offering me services at a rate that is below what they feel they need to ask in order to make a living. But I wanted to smash those ideas together. So this was a Linux user group, but these are businesses who are coming together. Um, they are still using the same software. I offer 
free help nights, so much like a Linux user group, except um, I'm treating it more like a chamber of commerce. So what my, my businesses do, and I'll go through what these businesses are in just a second, but what they do is they essentially come together and offer business-to-business -business tech support. These are um, cafes, restaurants, uh, yarn stores, Everything you can think of that is not technical shows up at this client user group. It um, encourages coopetition, which was a term that I learned from the tourism industry, which essentially says, um, okay, all of the golf resorts in the area should come together and produce one golf brochure that gets sent out, and we will promote our region as a golf destination. So it's those businesses who are technically competitors coming together to promote their own industry. Co-opetition. Uh, the free help nights also meant fewer small invoices for me. I didn't need to feel bad about, um, <laughs> about charging my one hour minimum when the question was typically over and over again, what's my password? Um, and it also encouraged bigger picture thinking because what I had happen was, um, we'll take a look at some of these uh, businesses here. Uh, what I had happen was these businesses would look at what the other people were doing, and I'm using a, a Drupal multi-site install, the technical part of it is in another talk, which if you want to know more, by all means ask. But basically, it's just a matter of turning on modules. So that meant when Colleen had her mailing list and Paul wanted a mailing list too, well, he knew that if Colleen could do it, he could do it, because they both had to ask what their password was at the beginning of the night. So clearly, they're both the same technical level. So what these businesses were able to do, this is um, a bed and breakfast, a bookshop, a uh, yoga studio, uh, domestic violence agency, um, 100 Mile Market is a, essentially a food shop, a cafe, uh, local green politician, yarn shop, and a second um, food shop. I think that's, oh, and yeah, we'll get to these guys in a second. So these businesses essentially egg each other on. And I don't have to do any kind of selling. They, they sit down in the same room and, um, you know, I perhaps give them little challenges, like I won't turn on e-commerce until you have all your products entered. So someone sits up at the front of the room on her computer and every time she gets a new product in, she yells, done, done. And you want to get people egged on, you want to get them motivated, you have someone at the front of the room yelling, first. And it's amazing what they'll do. So these businesses essentially convince each other that they need to do more things and they need to upgrade, they need to, they need to do more with their websites in ways that I can't convince them of. So the other interesting one in here is that one of these businesses who shows up to the help nights is um, an internet service provider who is sick and tired of handing out FTP accounts. He currently hands out about 400 FTP accounts. Now I've got about 15 or 20 clients He's got 400. All of a sudden, we're talking about me being a second or third tier support for 400 Drupal installations. They'll take care of the first tier, but he wants training to see what are the, what's the basic profile or what's the basic install profile that, they, that small businesses need. He watches how these businesses interact, and all of a sudden, this model of the free help night is incredibly, um, potentially incredibly profitable for someone like me who's working with very small clients. <clears throat> so there's a few things that make, make this work, that make the client user group experience work. One is to manage expectations. So one of the, the rules uh, for the client, the free help night, is that you need to show up with your laptop. Um, that is, <laughs> needs to have a wireless card because the first night someone showed up with a laptop that didn't have wireless enabled. That was kind of hard to explain. Um, and that you're not allowed to call me outside of free help night unless you're planning to pay. So it was starting to um, really prevent, not prevent, prevent's a bad word. It was starting to encourage businesses that I was supporting that I don't walk into their restaurant and ask for a free muffin because I'm hungry as much as they can't call me up and ask for free tech support because they want to update their website. So it was separating... Um, uh, access so that we could have friendly conversations that didn't turn into tech support uh, experiences. 
And they were still able to get the things done that they wanted to do because they knew that if it was important, they could pay me to get instant access. And if it wasn't that important, they could wait for the free help night. Charging appropriately, again, back to Nancy's story, I don't discount my rates because they are a smaller business or because they're a larger business. That means that when I work with companies of 400 employees, it's the same rate as when a company has one employee. The difference is that what I'm doing for one employee in an hour is based on five years experience of working with Drupal. So what I can accomplish in an hour and what the client is going to, to demand of me in an hour is incredibly reasonable. If I hadn't spent as much time with these micro businesses, I wouldn't have identified what all of the, what the profile was essentially that these businesses needed to have turned on. And in a lot of ways, what I want to do is to promote self-sufficiency. So I want them to be able to get to the point where they can go and do their own research online. They can go and say, this is the module I want to install. These are the reasons why I think I need to use it. Um, and the, the self-sufficiency is, is promoted uh, through a number of different things. One is the fact that just the more time they spend on their website, the more they're able to do all of their own tasks without support. Um, I write support materials for them in terms of uh, install instructions. And um, ultimately, my goal was, was for them to not need to come to me to do those basic tasks. This is where it gets interesting and where it becomes a bit of a failure. Let's see if the next slide is the right one for that. Yeah, awesome, right? Totally self-sufficient clients. Totally self-sufficient clients don't pay you anymore because they are totally self-sufficient. And $120 a year for hosting is not exactly going to pay the mortgage when you've only got 10 or 15 of these clients. So um, this is when I realized that the whole scratching your own itch thing, I had an itch that I needed to deal with. I needed to deal with the fact that I had these 10 or 15 clients who really couldn't afford much more than the original, you know, uh, in most cases it was less than $3,000. So they couldn't afford more than what they'd paid. And yet they didn't feel as though they'd gotten enough. They didn't feel confident and comfortable. <laughs> so I scratched the itch of aggregating all of those questions into one help night. And people came very regularly for about 10 months. And then one at a time, clients started dropping off because they could do all of the tasks that they needed to accomplish. They, they now had the mailing list. They knew what a blog was. They, they could update their site. They could add their products to their website. I mean, they, they were doing everything. So they stopped coming, which meant that I had fewer and fewer people showing up to egg each other on. And the ones who were coming were getting this amazing free tech support where we would do two hours of custom development because there was no one else there. So I stopped doing that. But it was this really interesting process of, okay, I scratched my own itch. That was pretty cool. Scratching your own itch doesn't really work in the same way for business because you need to have a plan. You can't just scratch your own itch. You have to have, what, it, what do we call those things in Launchpad? We call them blueprints, right? You have to know exactly what it is you're going to be doing with your clients. And I would say whether it's five years, more realistically, 18 months, you need to have a business plan. You need to actually know what the new products and services are that you're going to be offering to those clients 18 months from now. You need to know that they're actually going to use them. And this is the other thing that I ran into is like, okay, everyone next is totally going to want Ubercart installed. Everyone's going to want to do online, e-commerce, shipping around the world, beauty, awesome. Uh-uh, they didn't want to. They were actually really happy doing exactly the tasks that they were doing but I hadn't spent any time going and looking to bring in new businesses to include in this, in this client user group. So the marketing plan, um, not only do you need to know what those products are, but you actually have to go out and talk to people in the real world. You can't just sit online. You can't just run off to conferences around the world and talk about your client user group. You have to actually promote it in the community. And this, I mean, it wasn't a shocker. I absolutely knew that it was true, but it was amazing to watch the evolution of I had clients that I helped. I absolutely accomplished every single goal that I wanted to accomplish with them. I created self-sufficient clients. It was amazing. But then what started happening was this thing that I had completely not expected. All of a sudden, 
I had a whole bunch of businesses who wanted to know how to run the business that I was running because I was spending all of my time outside of my own community talking about it. So on um, the 100-mile client roster, there's two, two or three versions of it on SlideShare. Combined, they have over 3,000 views, which on the one hand is not that many, but on the other hand, <laughs> it's about pumpkin chuckers, right? Like, it's not, it's not anything earth-shattering. Um, I've presented at uh, DrupalCon, FOSDEM, FSOS, and now this LCA mini-conf. So I've gone to, what's that, Hungary, Belgium, Canada, and New Zealand to talk about this. And I probably get anywhere from one to five people who run freelance businesses coming to me every month saying, this is exactly the situation that I'm in as well. I need to be able to deal with exactly these kinds of clients. How do you do it? Well, they're not actually going to pay me for the answer. So what I did was I made a new website because that's what Drupal people do, right? You just spawn new websites. And what I'm doing in this website, um, I think is going to be really interesting. I don't think you'll be able to read that. So let me, uh, let me read it to you. I'm going to open source my business. And what that means is that what Hick Tech, which is the, the name of the company that has this client user group, what it's going to do over the next year is put out 12 kits. These should be numbered, because I'm not sure if I have all 12 here. The first one comes out uh, at the end of January, and it is an identity kit. Really basic stuff. Uh, how many people actually know how to make a trifold brochure? How many people need to know how to make a trifold brochure? Generally, there's more people who need to know how to make them than actually know how to make them. Um, like, how to get the lines to actually be where you want them to be so that you're not folding down the center. Marketing kit, planning calendars. Uh, what I offer as a class in April, I need to be promoting now. So how do you actually do that kind of really simple business stuff? Website hosting, the Drupal multi-site that I use with my clients, trivial to set up if you know how to deal with Drupal, really complicated if you have no idea what an Apache server is. Proposal writing kits, getting new clients, the money kit, budgeting, planning your work, new cash, bookkeeping, the workshop kit. Um, I've taught oh, a lot. I've taught a lot of workshops, let's just leave it at that. So some of the basic, um, how to define learning objectives, how to get the, the students who actually need to take the class that you're offering into your class. Um, should you be offering something with the word beginner, advanced, intermediate, those kinds of things will be going into the workshop kit. Uh, website kit is more in terms of um, how do you get clients to tell you what they actually need. The website kit is also um, based on four years of workshops that I've been giving, working with clients and basically saying, okay, so you think you need a website. Mm, are you sure? Because these are the things that you'll need to assemble and write content for and that kind of stuff. So the website kit is from the client side as opposed to um, technically how you set up the hosting. Newsletters, desktop publishing, conferences, because I've run a couple of those as well, and finally the membership kit. Oh, the other one is um, how to run a booth at a trade show, which isn't on this list. So it's been this weird sort of spiral from me talking about how to deal with clients to businesses asking me how I deal with clients to now open sourcing my business. And it's not, uh, it's not necessarily connected to my physical community. So now I'm going to have to think about what the next loop in the spiral is, probably for uh, 2011. It probably won't happen this year because I'll take the year to launch this and also plan the next step. But it's been a really interesting evolution, and there's probably other businesses who've gone through a similar thing where they only ever offer the same product or the same service, and then they get three years down the line and they realize they've trained everything on that one thing, and all of a sudden the clients are drying up. Or maybe the, you know, the big R word, the recession things happen, and you get tons of new clients because there's still some budget available but not quite as much. So you've got this awesome new influx of clients. You think you're going to be sky high. You think you're going to be good for ages. And then you've trained all those clients. So thinking about the next um, step for me in my business, um, I'm now working primarily with designers. And um, it's, sort of, it's kind of a weird way to end this talk because when I originally proposed it, I was still doing the client user group meetings. And now here we are six months later, I think, from when I first put in the submission. And it's, it's all kind of shifted a little bit. So I think... Um, 
I think there's probably other people in the audience who have similar stories. So my definition of success, um, I've got communities and interaction highlighted. Let's take a look at how that's changed now for the, lex the next um, sort of spiral of my business. I've got now businesses and client relationships is what I'm focused on. Um, a little bit different, but essentially, you know, the same structure. It's still important to me to be open. It's still important to me that people um, are productive. You know, that word hasn't changed at all. But the people that I'm working with have changed a bit. Um, the 100-mile client roster is where that, uh, those kits will be posted. At this point, um, if you want to be notified, sign up for the mailing list. And the two talks that I've given, which are similar to this one and have the technical details on the Drupal multi-site install, so actually what to put in your Apache configuration file and that kind of stuff, they're up online. I'm not going to bore you with them today. Um, and I think that's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much it. So at this point, I think I have 15 minutes left. Yeah, so I've got 15 minutes left, and um, I'm really interested in hearing what other challenges or experiences that other businesses have gone through where they've experienced a similar kind of growth um, and not even necessarily that they've gotten bigger, but how the business has shifted because they did or did not plan for it. Is there anyone that's actually willing to, to throw out their, I mean, I've done my fail talk, so you, know, you don't have to feel bad about any of this. Anyone else that wants to, oh, come on. I talked quickly for you so that you could share your stories. You're like, teehee, I just want to check my email. Come on, come on. Someone's got a story. I know that there was freelancers. I saw those hands go up when we started. I don't have candy to give you or anything. Oh, really? None? All right, okay. Who has questions? Yes. Not a single one. This is awesome. One! Nice. All right. I want to know everything, of course. <laughs> I want to do this as well. But um, you haven't been tempted to maybe move beyond the 100 miles or take on larger customers like government contracts yeah. or something like larger profit companies so, instead? Um, I already do that work. And this was, for me, reconnecting to my physical community. So because I was running around the world doing all of this stuff, I mean, I, I wrote a book on Drupal. It's been incredibly successful. Um, I've done a number of um, contracts in Toronto, which is about a two and a half hour drive for me with community colleges, doing curriculum development. So I have these bigger projects that are, I mean, 10 clients at $1,500 does not make a full-time income, mm -hmm. um, even in Owen Sound. <laughs> um, so for me, it was a way to reconnect with my, with my physical community. And then I sort of serviced, maybe that's a bad way to say it, but I had serviced my physical community. And there wasn't, unless I was able to spend more time physically there promoting that kind of work, there wasn't really a lot more for me to do because the clients had stopped coming to me because um, they were all, I mean, I, my circle of people I'd already met. Now, I, I probably spend in the range of five to seven months outside of my physical area. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to promote stuff locally when you're not on the ground going to business, like going to doing all the networky things. Um, so this was one way of reconnecting. Do I want to expand this concept to larger areas? Yes and no. Where I think it could get interesting is if I was contracted by um, a business improvement association or downtown improvement association or chamber of commerce to go in and work with the umbrella organization and train them on how to set up a 100-mile client roster, and then they service everyone below them. Um, but I, yeah, yeah go oh, ahead. Sorry, I was wondering then, is that sort of what you're hoping to get out of doing this project is because obviously you're saying like you give away something for free and then you get something exactly back. Yeah. yeah so um book number one was essentially a book that um designers have really latched onto for drupal mm. book number two i've been recalling the prequel and it is uh essentially much of the this information in terms of the kits but put together in a linear fashion so that someone could read from chapter one to chapter i don't know i think i have 15 chapters or something like that and they could um, be a business that sets up their own system. Not, not a hundred mile sort of with many people underneath the umbrella, but just a single business who wants a single installation of Drupal for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying it probably won't be until 2011 
that that book comes out, and then I start teaching workshops based on that book. So, um, yeah. Yeah. More I questions? questions so. Okay, yeah. <laughs> See if anyone else does. Yep, a question down here. Um, just, just wondering, were there, did you have any competitors or, or, or people doing similar things that you might have collaborated yeah. with within your, yeah. your area? So very interestingly, when I first moved back to Owen Sound, it was in 2004 or 2005-ish. And at the time, oh, bless them, they were all doing their own proprietary content management systems in like Cold Fusion. And um, that's why I started the technology conference was because I really wanted to get a better sense of community from the local developers. Owen Sound is about 20,000 people. We have about 60 web development shops. Um, it's a cottage industry, right? Like everyone and their nephew knows how to run web, how, knows how to run a website. And so we have this huge base of people that um, in many cases are, oh, what's the, the Dreamweaver one that, um, anyways, it's gone. You have to have a piece of software installed on a single computer which locks you into con like content editing on a remote server, and I can't remember what the name of it is. Anyways, they were doing these really archaic things that involved FTP and flat HTML, or they were super sophisticated cold fusion things with, I don't think that's what it was called, but it was, sorry? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Or, um, you know, cold fusion with MS, <laughs> MS Access backends. <laughs> Sorry. So these really horrible things. And then over the four or five years that I've been back in Owen Sound, um, there's now a number of people who are offering WordPress and Joomla. I think, no, sorry, there's one other Drupal person. But they're all consumers of um, open source technologies. So they're selling it based on the price tag of free, not as far as I know, none of them are in any way connected back into the open source community. So there's no sense, some, it's, it may be unfair to say this, but there's no sense of giving back. It's simply that they're using the brand name of WordPress or they're using the, the word, you know, the name recognition of Joomla to offer a service, but they're certainly not, as far as I know, putting back into the documentation pool or submitting patches into those code bases. In the next five years, we may see um, more of an evolution again to see more and more open source contributors. We definitely have a very strong um, Linux user group that does um, with the United Way. I don't know if they've got United Way down here. Uh, in Canada, they've got a lot more respect than they do in the States. And what we do is we take old hardware, um, put on, it happens to be Ubuntu right now, it doesn't matter what the distro is, and give it to school kids that can't afford computers. The really important thing with this program is that the computer literally has no value. If the United Way were to give away a computer that has value, that would be deducted from other government payments that they were receiving. So we've sort of worked around some of the things. So there's this sophisticated community, but it's not a commerce-related community. It's a gift community exclusively. So there's other, yeah, there's other interesting things that are happening locally. Any other questions? Um, in, in terms of support, did your amount of hours you had to spend for your clients go down drastically when you did your workshops? In uh, the workshops that I've done in my local community have been more hmm, basic, for lack of a better word. So they've been primarily offered through the, the Business Enterprise Center, which is a government-funded um, sort of start your own business because you won't get fired kind of thing. Uh, and they've been really, really basic workshops. Like, you've heard of this Facebook thing. This is may, why you may want to use it for your business. Um, in our region, we're still at about 40% limited to uh, dial-up internet connectivity because of the terrain. Uh, it's really hilly and very low population density, therefore very expensive to run wires. And, uh, um, uh, you know, when you can just see the other point. What's the... Yeah, see, you guys know what this stuff is. Um, that's really hard because people live at bottoms of hills as well as tops of hills. Um, so the business uh, classes, the workshops that I do that I get paid to do are typically really basic. This is welcome to high speed. This is what you're about to experience. The free help nights, um, I limited to two hours once a month. So it really was encouraging people to save up their questions, think about their website during the month, 
And if it became urgent, they needed to be spread far enough apart that if there was something urgent, they would pay me to do it. So that's how I, I does that answer the question, yeah, hopefully? Yep. Okay, good. Other questions? Is that all? Oh, yeah. Sorry, you mentioned that uh, most of the open source software you've been using, like Drupal, for websites and things. Um, does that expand into the desktops or, or beyond just the websites that you are helping people with? So the desktop support that I've been doing is completely different. Um, Owen Sound is primarily a retirement community. We have a lot of widows. Um, it's, I, I say this with love and affection for my community, true, deep love and affection, but it's a place that people go to die. Um, and it really, like, the, there is a huge retirement community there. So the desktop support that I tend to give is, again, paid at my full rate, widows who have always relied on their husbands to turn on the computer, get digital photos off of the cameras, send email to grandkids, that kind of thing. And they, for whatever reason, are not able to make the connection with their children to teach them how to use the computer, whether they're embarrassed or whatever it happens to be. And so we're not doing... Um, free and open source software uh, desktop support. It is more based on this is the system that your husband was using. Um, let me disable his MSN account in terms of not having that pop up every time you log into the computer because that's just kind of weird if they've already died. Um, but it's, it's a very different kind of technical support than what I'm doing with Drupal. It's not that I want to say it's more humane, but it's, it's not about accomplishing tasks. It's about... Um, developing relationships with grandchildren, typically. And a lot of them, they really don't care what the software is. So if I magically changed their browser one day from Internet Explorer to Firefox, they'd have no idea. If they needed to buy a new computer and it was Ubuntu instead of Windows, they wouldn't, rec like, they wouldn't notice the difference between them because they're so uncomfortable with the desktop experience that uh, switching it, they wouldn't necessarily see the difference. That said and done, um, I have set up my dad on Ubuntu, and he said it was easier to run than his old Mac. So there's some successes there. <laughs> Other, and I, I think it can work for the desktop as well. Um, it's just a matter of deciding what the services that you're going to offer and whether or not there really is a market for it. Um, it seems as though providing support for the desktop, you're in competition with kids unless you're going after um, uh, larger companies. So you're offering sort of... Uh, and in-house support for printers and, and um, you know, 100 computers at a time, but not necessarily for the micro-businesses that I'm dealing with, where you've got a computer for an entire office, and they tend to have kids who will show up after school and help them out with those little tasks. Yep. Is that time, or is that five minutes? Any other questions? Uh, you, you said earlier that um, you know right at the start you have to define what your goals are, what you're, um, what you want to get out of it. Um, do you have, do you, when you started on this uh, path or um, this or crazy any, adventure, yeah, yes, or any, any time <laughs> did you did you define goals in terms of um, adoption of open source software? Like you know I want to get, um, you know th this is a goal for me. No, um, and so therefore. Okay. That's, that's and, but that was the thing, right? Like, this is my lesson from the other side of this whole experience, is that my goal was to get rid of the five-minute phone calls. My goal was to deal with the fact that my aunt would call me up and say, hi, I just have this little question about my website. And I'd be like, I'm not coming in asking for free muffins. So how was I going to deal with the essentially inappropriate relationships that had developed with some of the people who should have been paying me for this technical support. And that was my, I mean, that's why at the end, the lesson at the end of this is that it was a fabulous way of dealing, you know, scratching your own itch, right? It scratched an itch that everyone loved. Like the clients, they, and some of them were, you know, they paid, they were paying an arm and a leg, and they were getting more and more frustrated at how much they were paying to go home and still not feel comfortable with the system that they had paid for. So it really, they were excited about it. I was excited about it. They egged each other on. There was this fabulous business relationship that developed. And then once people actually 
knew what they were doing. They stopped coming to the help night, and I hadn't planned for that. It was like I thought that even though the goal was self-sufficiency, I was pretty sure that they would always need my help because they couldn't remember their password. So that was, I mean, that's a huge, huge mistake on my part was to not plan far enough in advance to, to see that I would actually accomplish the goal of self-sufficiency. So then there was the second part of the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know, just, um, just um, following on from what you were just saying then is, I mean, so what you're saying is, I'm trying to get a grasp of whether this is a sustainable thing for a person sitting in a town that's not going to move. Is this a sustainable business because you're going to do yourself out of a job? Um, are there... I mean, I guess what I was trying to ask is, are there new mar are there new areas or markets that you could tap into without, um, you know, without doing the other work, um, or is it a matter of that you've lifted the education of the of the whole area um, to a, to a point where they are completely um, self, you know? Yeah, yeah. Do so I themselves? think a, a lot of it is is um, having leadership isn't quite the right word, but it is sort of the right word. So, for example, I'm now doing a lot more. Um, uh, email campaigns, a lot more newsletter campaigns. And that's something that ultimately my clients are now starting to say, hey, um, I really like the HTML emails. And you told me that you have stats associated with that. I want to get more involved in that. Or I've got another client that's now um, doing Facebook ads. So there's definitely, definitely other opportunities there. Are they opportunities that I want to take? Mm, not really. Um, I kind of like traveling. I kind of like running around the world. <laughs> um, so then it's a question of, okay, so this business, I really wanted to connect with my physical community. Are there more opportunities there? Absolutely. Are they opportunities that I want to take? Mm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. But the lessons that I've learned there, do I want to take to other communities and help other people set up equivalent systems? Yes, for sure. Um, but I also want people to have their eyes open this is a system, this is, you know, the, the client user group is awesome and it will absolutely work for, I would say, up to a year flawlessly and everyone will be deliriously happy with it. But if you don't have something planned for after that first year, if you don't know that you're going to install a new module, which they're all going to need to, you know, have more in-depth training than what they can get in that free two-hour session, you, know, you, you have to know what it is that you're going to roll out for people. You've actually just about answered most of it, but um, I was just thinking that some of the concepts of the kits that you had, some of them were like universal and would work in any country. Yep. Um, some would have to be sort of um, internationalized, for, like some of the accounting stuff or the business stuff. And I was Oops. just wondering how you were going to go about that, but I think Where you might have just mentioned that you'd expect people to, to assist. Okay. So um, the great thing about open sourcing your business is that it will be open source. Uh, they will be, all of the kits that are listed here will be licensed uh, Creative Commons, they may go public domain or be um, buy, but my whole plan for these is for people to download the basic kit, rebrand it as their own, make it their own, you know, the base for their stuff, and contribute back into the pool wherever it's regionally relevant to do so, whether it's a simple language translation. Um, at this point, I haven't... Technically, I know how to do hosting. Technically, I know how to... Um, put together versioned, surprisingly, because I gave that talk this morning, um, versioned systems, you know, sort of version control and project management and that kind of stuff. But I'm not sure how I want to, how I want to go about it yet, because a lot of that stuff is binary, and because a lot of it is, it really isn't code, it's not even images, it's concepts, and I'm not sure how I want to deal with um, accepting new things back into the project in a way that it makes it easier to grow and grow and grow. Uh, certainly, for example, the, the money kit, um, I've had a lot of people say, what I actually really need is taxation information. Wow. Well, okay, good luck with that. <laughs> um, so it may be that the contributions back are simply people saying, here's the link for my jurisdiction on the tax stuff that I need to know for my business. And that may be, you know, with a, a translated version of the kit in terms of uh, changing the locale of it and submitting back links. And that may be... Um, what it becomes, but certainly uh, my goal is for, I mean, I went looking for this stuff and I can't find it. Maybe it exists and maybe I use the wrong keywords, but I can't find any centralized space of this, uh, this range of templates for people who want to run open source businesses. 
there's lots of little parts, but I've not, I mean, and if people, if someone says, I know a project that already does this, please let me know, because this is a piss load of work, and if I don't have to do it, that'd be two thumbs up for me. Um, so if you already know that this exists, please let me know. But as far as I know, there's not an open source project that has this kind of thing for, for businesses. So I, you know, I'm doing it. <laughs> so that's, I think that's my time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>